So, welcome everybody to the fifth session of the day, where we're going to talk about powering a sustainable future, a topic which is very much uh, debated these days. My name is Nils Röcke, and I'm Executive Vice President of Sustainability in Sintef, and also copying as the President of the European Energy Research Alliance, which mobilizes 50,000 energy researchers in, in Europe. And I've gone quite a long way myself in terms of focus areas, being educated at NTNU, or NTH at that time, at the Institute for Steam and Combustion Technology, and ending up with being uh, Executive Vice President for Sustainability. So quite a long travel there. I'm delighted to be hosting this uh, session. I look forward to hearing from each of the speakers on how we can power ourselves sustainably. This has become even more relevant, of course, with the dire backdrop of what we see in Eastern Europe uh, these days. And we need to ensure energy security, competitiveness and sustainability. This is often called the energy trilemma. And how do we move in that uh, space? First out, um, I'm honored to be joined by the Minister of Climate and Environment, Espen Bart Ede. Espen, please come to the stage. We'll talk about Norway's commitment to sustainable energy solutions. Take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Nils. Thank you, Nils. Uh, it's great to be here at uh, Techport, uh, great to be in Trondheim, our technology capital, and great to be here with so many innovators and people who will be enablers of the transition that will happen, that needs to happen, and in which I hope Norwegian companies and Norwegian academia and Norwegian innovation can take a leading edge, because there is no doubt that it will happen. Uh, what we can influence is whether we are a key part of it, or whether we let others do it for us, and that's a big question. Uh, I think I know the answer, I think we will succeed, but that's really what this is now about, because I am deeply convinced that the energy transition is happening, and it's going to go faster than many people have thought, and it will be accelerated by the geopolitical crisis that we are currently seeing. It will be accelerated, that is not only my view, but uh, in recent contact with uh, key allies and uh, key people in the European Union, uh, I, 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 I become just more convinced that what they, they are seeing is that you need now to work both on even speedier decarbonization, meaning that you need to move from fossil to renewable even faster than you thought you needed to because you want to become independent of Russian energy supplies and the rest of us cannot supply enough. So even if there will be a demand for gas from Norway for quite a while, for instance, there will be an accelerated decarbonization effort. But there will also be an accelerated circular economy effort. The circular economy is needed for nature's sake. We can't go on using resources as we have before to you know do, dig for them or, or, or to excavate for them and then use them and throw them away. We need a more circular approach because of the nature crisis, because of biodiversity, because the need to preserve nature as carbon sinks. But now it's also become a geopolitical necessity because we are seeing that this, the degree of interdependence also with countries with whom many countries now want to have less contact, has been so intense that you need to be circular even for that reason. So these things are happening. Uh, the, the, the climate crisis and the nature crisis is increasingly understood, not only by activists, uh, not only by uh, innovative businesses, uh, now also by uh, policymakers across the world and particularly in the leading industrial countries. And what we are seeing now, which is fascinating to follow, is that we are now beginning to see serious efforts in which you are transforming not single sectors, but across sectors. The European Union's Fit for 55 program, uh, the focus on uh, uh, European Green Deal, the taxonomy which, uh, uh, which points out if you're a private investor, a bank, uh, if, if, what kind of investments can be declared as genuinely green, 
all of this is a part of an effort to actually transform the entire economy all at the same time, looking for how can we become more renewable and less fossil? How can emissions go down in every single sector? That's buildings and construction and agriculture and fishing and transport and industry and uh, etc. Every possible sector. And how can all these be connected in order to make all this work? And in every single sector, there is now concrete legislation coming out, which aims not only to reduce emissions, but also to increase circularity, and where you have a do no harm principle, meaning that you, in order to achieve one of the goals, you cannot undermine the other goals that are the overarching goals for this. This is fascinating, and it matters a lot also for us. We are connected to this in several ways. We in Norway are part of the EEA, the European Economic Area, so much of this regulation will come this way. Uh, we are also a, a full part of the ETS, the, the, uh, the quota system, which will also now be expanded and transformed and where you will see that the quotas will be cut faster so that they will eventually rise in price. Uh, you know, emitting will be increasingly expensive, deliberately so. Uh, and we are connected through a climate agreement that was entered into uh, by the former government with massive support from us, but practically all parties in government voted in favor with the European Union. So we are working together to reduce our climate emissions with Europe already. What we need to add is an even more active policy of connecting to the industrial parts of the Green Deal because the markets for almost everything that we want to develop in Norway is fundamentally the European market plus. It's not fundamentally China. I mean, of course, we shall try, but it's very much the European market. And one interesting thing that I would like to point out from where I sit is that almost everything we hear about now, hydrogen, blue or green hydrogen, production of hydrogen, distribution of hydrogen, use of hydrogen in, 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 in transport, you know, in, in, in shipping, in, in, in heavy transport, or in industry, both as an energy source or as a part of the chemical process as a reduction uh, uh, component. All of this happens because there are climate policies. Why would you do it if you didn't care about emissions? The, 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 ex, the, the exponential demand for battery technology, why would you do it? Well, of course, because you want to stop using diesel and petrol and gasoline for your, for your cars. That's why you need batteries, thanks to climate policies. Why do you care about carbon capture and storage? Well, of course, again, because you want to end emissions or to reduce emissions. Why do you want sort of much more efficient legislation in buildings? Because you want to reduce energy use. So the sort of the backdrop of all this is the recognition that we need to work faster towards uh, our climate goals. Uh, and that's good news. Uh, the good news is it's happening, it's moving in the right direction. Most smart innovators, or the most people coming out of everything from NTNU uh, to Stanford, of course, will now say, I want to be part of the new. I don't want to cling to the old, I want to be part of the new. Thankfully so, logical, that's the only sort of smart life strategy now, is to try to be part of this. So it's moving in the right direction. My worry, however, is that it's not moving fast enough. It's not moving fast enough. We are still heavily dependent on fossils. We're still heavily dependent on all solutions. We, are still, uh, we still have a lot of our industry and the way we live and the way we travel rooted in the 20th century economy rather than the 21st century economy. So it's becoming a race against time. Will technology and solutions and policies win, or will we, will we emit so much that it will be very hard to live decent lives by the middle of this century? That's the stark choice. That's really the stark choice, and that's why we really need innovation to move, uh, to move uh, forward. Some years ago, I think people in my positions possibly needed occasionally to go to a business crowd or a tech crowd and say, hey guys, there's a green shift going on. That's all news. Everybody knows, thankfully. That's already recognized. It's recognized well into investors, innovator, engineers, uh, you know, the, the, the unions. This, this is happening. What policy today should be about 
is really to make sure that the different elements of this meet, that we make sure that what we produce of new energy sources can also be used on the other, other side, that too much discussion is about what are the new sources and what are the new carriers. And we also need to think about how that can be used and applied in all the different, uh, you know, in all the different sectors that uses energy. And, uh, and that's where I very much believe in this idea of a mission-oriented economy, where you, where you agree business, academia, uh, policymakers together that there are certain major overarching goals that, will, that we will try to achieve in, on a certain date, to a certain degree, and then spell it out and say, this is the goal, we will get there, how do we get there? That's the mission, that's, that's how we have, want to develop the mission, a much more active strategic use of all the tools we already have. That's really my message, that's really where I think we have to move in order to make the best out of what is coming our way, which is a very, very direct, directional change from uh, fossil, to renewable, from linear to circular, and towards sustainable, or away from, as it was said in the previous session, from, um, uh, uh, from uh, uh, what was it, dirty? Maria? <laughs> dull, dirty. Dull, dirty, and uh, dangerous. dangerous. Dull, dirty, I love that. Dull, dangerous, uh, away from that, that was the 20th century. Now we are building a new approach to all of this, and that's a fascinating development, and we need to be part of it. And then we need venues like this. And that's my final point. That's why we need Trondheim, that's why we need all of you, that's why we need Techport. Thank you. Thank you, Espen. Um, we don't have time, but I'm still going to ask you a question, you know, because uh, you were talking about the, um, uh, the different drivers behind the uh, green shift and the energy transition. And these days, I mean, we had the IPCC who had the, their Working Group 2 report came, coming out some three weeks ago or something. And nowadays, we don't really talk about this report as much because it's energy security and security of supply all the time. And um, um, I'm thinking, I'm a bit worried that we, we may be too short-sighted here. So how do we balance this urgency versus the other urgency of uh, becoming climate neutral and, uh, well, nature neutral? So we have an acute crisis which is very serious, very deep, which has led to much more focus on energy security indeed. And then we have the deep long-term crisis. But my point is that I think they, in a, in a sense, they overlap because many of the people who have imported Russian oil and gas, they now see an additional argument to get rid of it, right? An additional argument to become less dependent and more autonomous. And one of the good news about renewable energy, it provides for countries to have a more autonomous or at least a more independent uh, energy source. Uh, so I think that the, the two will, in a sense, strengthen each other rather than be in conflict. I think that's the outcome, and that's my sense, at least in this part of the world, that that's the way it's heading. Great. We need to talk more about this, you know. <laughs> Espen Bartede. And um, I'm really pleased to hear uh, Espen talk about hydrogen, you know, because uh, We'll now hear an intervention from uh, NTE and from H2 Marina uh, about hydrogen. And I'm delighted to welcome Astri Svarva and Thomas Fikstal to the stage. And while they're coming up here, I'll read their short CV. I mean, Astri is the Executive uh, Director for Technology and Digitalization at NTE. And Thomas is the Chief Technology Officer in uh, H2 Marina, which I know also is partner in our new center, the Hydrogen E. And um, uh, we now see the green and digital being the key message from, from Europe and Brussels. And let us hear uh, more about this. What are your plans in, in that picture? So welcome, Astrid and Thomas. Take it away. Thank you very much, Nils, and thank you for the invitation to speak at Trondheim Techport. My name is uh, Astrid Svarva. Yes, and my name is Thomas Lexter. Yes, and we will take you through our journey uh, uh, for uh, going from pilot to scale up on H2. 
So that's the topic here. So first, a bit on the background here. As we all know, the world is warming up. We need to reduce the world's greenhouse gas emissions, and we need to do this as fast as possible. Uh, my belief is that we have the solutions, we have the knowledge, and we do have the technology to do so. But we do need to speed things up a bit. Also, uh, we see even before this war in Ukraine, the energy prices in the world markets are peaking. Electricity, oil, gas, it's all peaking for various reasons, but we see that there are some issues in the world energy markets that needs to be resolved. Also this, as fast as possible. At the same time, and of course related, we see that the world energy um, system is changing. It's under a huge change. If we are to reduce the world's greenhouse gas emissions, we cannot do this by electrifying everything, building strong electrical grid infrastructure with passive consumers as we have done today. Basically, we are now at the drawing board. We are sketching the energy system for a carbon neutral future. Uh, this will look quite different. Uh, it will have a lot more unregulated renewable energy sources, um, power production. We will have way more active consumers and the need for storage and transportation of energy will be essential. And this is why we believe that green H2 will be a big part of uh, the future energy system. Climate targets are intensivated, and the time we have to do something about it, to fix it, is reduced all the time. Uh, decarbonizing different sectors will require different solution. Today we will talk about the maritime sector. Transportation and industry accounts for 55% of Norway's CO2 emissions. Fossil maritime fuels accounts for 20% of the emissions. That is more than 5 million tons of CO2 equivalents. Decarbonizing this will require more green power and it will require new green industry. We believe that by taking lead in the green maritime uh, transition, we can build new green industry in Norway. And this is what we'll talk more about. So, a bit more into the details here. Uh, here you can see Rørvik. Rørvik is a small city with uh, a big maritime industry and a big maritime tradition. Uh, you see this, uh, this is a traffic analysis for ships along the coast of mid-north Norway. Uh, the more red this line is, the more ships pass through. And if you look at Rørvik here, you can see that almost all ships going south-north, north-south, are passing through this point. So it's actually an excellent location for a hydrogen hub. Actually, more than 35,000 ships pass this point yearly. Uh, we have a broad support from local industry and politicians in the area. We have a wide range of international ships. Uh, we have quite low and predictable uh, electricity prices. And also the local grid company, Tensio and Statnet, has a long-term plan for for, uh, for making investments in the local grid. So it's a good, um, good start. And to zoom in a bit, you can see on the left-hand side here is Rørvik. 
The red dotted line is the main ship route through the area. And the circle points at the Kroka coastal base, which, where uh, the H2 facilities will be located in the future. And Thomas will take you a bit more detail into that. Yes, thank you, Austin. So, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure for a young and innovative company like uh, H2 Marina to uh, uh, to cooperate with a big industrial player like Ante Air, with your uh, competence, knowledge, and capability to carry out and realize industrial projects. So, together, um, H2 Marina and Ante Air, we walk the talk. Together, we realize the world's first local production and bunkering system for green hydrogen, bunkering, being able to bunker um, operating vessels for the aquaculture. And this we are going to realize in 2023. The project initiator for this pilot project is the renewable energy cluster, Renergy, located here in Trondheim and Trondelag. And they have brought together a consortium um, representing all the actors throughout the whole uh, hydrogen value chain from renewable power production to hydrogen production, hydrogen bunkering systems, and also the development of a hydrogen fueled aquaculture vessel. <coughs> and we have also had the opportunity to receive funding from the very good Pilot E funding program. Uh, uh, being organized by Innovation Norway, ENOVA, and the Norwegian Research Council. So, our motto is, think big, start small, learn fast. So this is why we start with a small pilot project, but we have even bigger plans. Our next step is in, in 2025 to realize a large-scale hydro, uh, hydrogen hub at Rørvik to be able to serve all kinds of ships and also other industrial consumers. So, this is how we believe that uh, Kråkøya Kjøstavn or Kråkøya Coastal Base will look like in the near future and we will locate our large-scale hydrogen hub uh, very strategically. Uh, it's uh, shown here down to the left. And as you see, there are lots of other uh, industrial players locating in this area. So we will have the opportunity not only to uh, produce hydrogen and uh, serve hydrogen as a fuel, but we will also have the opportunity to think uh, uh, in an industrial symbiosis where we also will use the byproducts from the green hydrogen production. Uh, we use renewable power to split water into hydrogen and oxygen and the byproducts, oxygen and waste heat from the electrolysis, we will be able to uh, sell to the other consumers at the coastal base. From our, our hydrogen hub, we will, of course, offering the opportunity for local hydrogen bunkering to the maritime business. We will also be able to distribute hydrogen, both as an export, but also as a fuel system for the larger ships. And last but not least, industrial symbiosis, which means being able to utilize and sell the byproducts from electrolysis, oxygen and waste heat, and in this way we increase the efficiency of the process and also makes us able to take down the costs of hydrogen. So, as a summary, Antea and H2 Marina, we are together powering a sustainable future. There is a huge potential of reducing both local and global emissions with green hydrogen. 
The first vessels running on green hydrogen will be in operation next year. There is a great opportunity for Norwegian industry, both onshore and offshore. And last but not least, and this I would like to address to Minister Bart Eide, it's very important that the authorities and the government follow up the very good funding programs that we have today, also in the future, to ensure that we will be able to further development the Norwegian hydrogen industry. Thank you. Wow, that was something. Thank you very much, Austin Thomas. And uh, I'll be picking up the phone shortly to discuss more about partnership in one of the national centers for hydrogen, Hydrogeny, which is just about to be uh, started. So, um, without further ado, I'm now going to uh, introduce uh, Christine Jordal, which is uh, chief researcher in Sintef Energy, and she'll talk about a project which I happen to know quite well, which is called Access, uh, which is about, well, CCS actually. So take it away, Christine. Christine Jordal. Yes, I will talk about the technology for carbon dioxide removal, but before doing that, I will start with some facts. These are measurements of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, starting from 1958, with seasonal, seasonal variations up to our days, starting at around 300 ppm up to above 400 ppm, or 0.03% CO2 in the atmosphere up to above 0.04% CO2 atmosphere. So these are small numbers, but I mean, you're intelligent people, you know this is a huge difference, and this is, we're trapping more heat in the, in the atmosphere with this. And you would think that it's established, it's measurements, these are facts. This should be textbook knowledge, right? Well, it isn't. This is a photo I've taken from my daughter's science book a couple of weeks ago. She's 14 years, and they teach her at school that we have 0.03% of CO2 in the atmosphere, even if we have the facts that show that that's not a fact. And we know why we have this. We have been taking for more than 200 years at an accelerating speed fossil fuels, and also in the case of cement limestone used in industrial processes, and emitted CO2 to the atmosphere. But we also have some good news today, that from these industries, we know that we can capture and store CO2. This is happening now in the Longship project in Norway, for instance. So we have the technology to, to, um, to remove CO2 from industries. But we also need to remove CO2 at, from the atmosphere. We are at the point now that we can't reach climate goals only by doing CCS. We, we need to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And why, why, one way of bridging this gap is to use biomass. Biomass absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere through its photosynthesis, and we can use this in industrial processes, capture the CO2 and store it, and that is carbon dioxide removal. I will not get into the sustainability of biomass in this talk. This is not about cutting down a lot of trees and burning them, but it's, it's a very important topic when you consider carbon dioxide removal. Because carbon dioxide removal, that is what the Access Project is all about. It's a European project, 18 million euros over four years. We've been going on for almost a year now, and it's dedicated to carbon dioxide removal from different angles. And one of the things we're going to do is to demonstrate a CO2 capture technology that is environmentally friendly. It's uh, a liquid, what we call a solvent, that can wash CO2 out of the exhaust gases from industries. And the technology we're using, it's potassium carbonate dissolved in water. It's very nice, except that it's very slow at the temperatures we want to use it. So to resolve this, an enzyme has been added to this uh, solvent. It's the same enzyme as we use in our lungs that helps uh, take up the CO2 much faster. So it's an Italian technology, but we're going to test it for the first time in Europe here in Norway at Fortum. Those of you who follow CCS, you know that we had some very good news last, last week. Fortum will probably soon be Hafslund Eco or something. They will start building their full-scale CO2 capture project as part of Longship, 
after the summer. But they are dedicated to supporting co the continued implementation of CO2 capture and CCS. Uh, and they there, therefore have agreed to host the first tests of this technology because they also have, they have a mobile test plant, which is very good for testing CO2 capture at pilot scale before you go to full scale. And you can see the highest of those silver pipes there at this mobile test unit, that is the absorber where the flue gas, the exhaust gas goes out, a small slipstream of it, and the solvent drips down and washes the CO2 out of the, out of the emissions. And I said it was mobile, but it has mo hasn't moved much so far. It's been at Fortum, but we're going to change that in access. So I'm going to take you on a journey now, so you're going to see where this rig will be going. It will test at Fortum this summer. It's being modified now as I speak for those tests. And then we will take it to Technology Center Monster. Now, Technology Center Monster is probably the best place in the world, the safest place to test new CO2 capture technologies. <laughs> And you may wonder, why would we take it there after Fortum Clermont-Sruit? If it works at Clermont-Sruit, it's probably going to work at Mongsta. But we're also bringing one more piece of equipment there. And now it's getting really cool. We're bringing something that is called a rotor pack bed absorber. This is like a spinning disc, a compact disc like this, where you can further increase the contact between exhaust gas and uh, this enzymatic solvent. So you can take up the CO2 even faster you can make the equipment smaller and cheaper, and uh, it will be delivered in a container. So you can see here the, the pilot rig and the container with the orange um, contours there. That is where the rotor pack bed absorber will be placed. This means that we can remove the highest of these pipes, make the CO2 capture more compact, and hopefully also cheaper. And uh, once this has all been assembled in containers at Technology Center Mongsta, the rig will continue to travel. We'll move it to Sweden, to Stora Ense, craft pulp mill that pr uh, produces fluff for diapers. They use treetops, branches, and uh, wood from thinning the forests when they produce this. It's a big, it's a big industry. They emit 1.2 million tons of CO2 from, per year. It's all from biomass. They burn the waste after they produce the pulp or the fluff uh, and emit the exhaust, exhaust already today. So it's really a long, low-hanging fruit for doing carbon dioxide removal at scale. So first, we're going to test this um, in a pilot to understand how it works. And then the final stop in the project will be to go to um, Poland, a Heidelberg cement. This is one of Europe's largest and most modern cement plants. It emits two and a half million tons of CO2 per year and uh, two-thirds come from the limestone they calcinate. You can't do much about that. That's part of the process. But they also burn a lot of waste fuel, which has partly biomass in it. It's about 10% of the emissions are from biomass. There is a potential for carbon dioxide removal also in this industry. And uh, I only told you a little bit about what the access is about. Well, it's quite a big part of the pilot testing, but we're doing a lot of other activities on carbon dioxide removal. We have a consortium of 18 members. We're leading this from Sintem in Trondheim. I have the privilege to lead this together with very good colleagues. We're also doing a lot of research in this project in Sintef, including uh, investigating and optimizing the chains to, from the trans captured CO2 to the transport uh, to the storage on the Norwegian continental shelf. And it's all dedicated to carbon dioxide removal, which is something we will need to protect the climate of our Earth. I don't think my daughter, who has this science book with 0.03% of CO2 in the atmosphere, I don't think she will ever live in an Earth with 0.03% uh, CO2. But we owe it to her. We owe it to her generation and the generations coming after to do all the efforts we can to limit the effects of the industrial industrialization and CO2 emissions that's been going on for a couple of centuries. And the work we're doing, uh, the technology collaboration we have across Europe in eight different countries, 18 partners, this is part of the effort that we have to do to succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. It's going to be exciting to see how this develops. So quite a, a busy session now. So. We're pivoting, we're changing from these um, uh, presentations we've had, which have 
long time, well, seven to 10, 12 minutes, to pitches, which are going to be two min minutes uh, each. So we ask some startups here uh, to give, uh, to showcase their innovation. And first joining us from Motkraft um, is Anders Rodem. Anders, please join us here. And uh, Motkraft is Norway's first non-profit electricity company. Only charges what is absolutely necessary. Could that be true? Interesting to hear. Go on. It is actually true. Uh, we are Norway's first non-profit power and electricity company. So we uh, are registered as a non-profit organization and we deliver electricity to end consumers just as uh, Fortum and NTE and other actors like Fjordkraft are doing. But we decided that we aren't going to make any money or any profit on the sale of electricity. And why is that? <laughs> we think that a lot of electricity companies traditionally are getting outdated. They don't have any real value left in the supply chain. And we also believe that they charge way too much for the service for a lot of end consumers. And that's why we started Moodcraft, a, a company that cannot physically make any money selling electricity to end consumers. And we made it as tight as we could, where there's no option for us to ever take more than what it actually costs to get you electricity to your home. And we set that price and set it in stone for the next 80 years. We started around six months ago and went live in the electricity market. And so far, we gained a bit over 25,000 customers. That's 25,000 homes that are powered by Motkraft. We've saved our, comp our, uh, our customers over 9 million kroners so far. And they're saving more and more money every single day. And we, I see that I'm running out of time, so I'll speed up. We operate on a win-win win mentality, where we put our customer first, and then the environment, and then we can see company profits. And I think that's a, a great vision for the future, and more companies should adapt it. Our goal is to save our customers 4 billion Norwegian kroners a year, and now we're venturing into new markets and doing more for the end consumer than what's been done so far. So I'm not going to leave you by saying you should change your power provider. I'm going to leave you saying that you should uh, see new business models as an opportunity and not an obstacle, where we say, hey, we're going to make a non-profit organization in an industry like the energy sector. We started getting laughed at, and then we launched it, and people loved it. So you got to make space for change, and then you can make space for, for yourself. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anders. Um, yeah, I have to consider who I'm going to, to sign up for next time. Um, so the, uh, the next is um, Patrick Ononli and Margrethe Markusen from uh, Vingrip Energy, um, which you may have read about if you read our local newspaper last uh, Saturday. Uh, working on, on wind engine energy and focusing on the agricultural sector and with a uh, vertical uh, wind turbine, a concept I've seen around for many years. Is it now going to work? Take it away. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we are representing uh, Windgrip, which is a windmill company from Snosa, which is north in Trøndelag. Uh, I'm Margaret, this is my colleague Patrick, is going to take you through it. In the media today, we can see a heightened focus on the price of electricity. Together with the effects this has on the farming industry, prices have been rising, might continue to rise, and the natural consequence is that energy demanding production will have an unpredictable, unpredictable financial impact. We have developed a vertical wind axis turbine our product is well suited for several applications. However, we have chosen to focus on the Norwegian primary industries. Since this is a market that is well known for us and that one is reasonably close to our operations. The first turbine going out of our production facilities for pilot customers will yield a low margin. However, the main purpose is to prove the concept. 
With a lifetime of 20 years, we expect our wind turbine to be profitable for our customers within six to seven years. Further, we intend to develop our product. And the future is to incorporate the possibility of recycling used car engines to, to power our generators. This will highly reduce the production cost and at the same time contrib contributing to a sustainable solution for the car manufacturers. Yes, so this is also for everybody here an investment opportunity because we are seeking investors. So if anyone wants to invest, we are out there on the stand. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick and Margrethe. And uh, that was a, a true sales pitch there at the end, but that's allowed from this scene. So, our third speaker is Haidal Riber, which is uh, CTO of Enonite, whose mission is to accelerate modern energy solutions through data insights. Enonite empowers energy developers to make confident decisions, which sounds like something which is in high demand. Haidal, the floor is yours. Let's give him a big hand. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I think the introduction really resonated with us uh, in Endonite, so thank you very much for that, uh, Espen. Uh, we in Endonite, we have founded the company on a very basic principle, and that is the fact that renewable energy is simply not built fast enough. So every year in Europe, we spend 50 billion euros to build renewable energy. But even with this huge sum, we're not going to get even halfway to the EU's goal of 40% renewables by 2030. And one of the reasons for this, one of the reasons why uh, we're not going to build enough with the current growth rate is because we simply can't find enough good locations to build on. Every potential new renewable energy location must be screened against a high number of factors. You can't build close to endangered species or ecological areas. You can't build too far for the grid because it's not going to be profitable. And you don't want to build somewhere where there's a risk of natural disaster, such as flooding. And today, this is all done manually. It's very slow and expensive. But luckily for all of us, this can be automated with software. And that's what we do in Enonite. So in our platform, all you have to do is upload your location, the coordinates of your location, and it's automatically screened against a higher number of factors than what is typically provided today. And the report becomes instantly shareable with their organization, enabling collaboration and rapid decision making. So until now, we have already analyzed 500 plus uh, locations for our customers. And this is what one of them has to say. What used to take 50 hours now takes two seconds. So we have given the energy developers, we've given them speed, we've given them confidence, and we've given them data-driven decision making for how they build renewable energy. And to do this, we built quite a large team comprising of uh, 13 people with two mentors. We have a lot of experience in uh, business and in previous startup, from previous startups, but also, of course, a lot of programming experience, which is important in the software company. Thank you very much, and we are in the night. Wow, that was impressive. Uh, so, uh, our last speaker, um, I would like to introduce uh, Vette Frigsta and Theodor Rasmussen. They are CFO and sales manager of SolarSeek. SolarSeek provides a two-in-one solution merging solar panels with external window blinds, which can be mounted on industrial and office buildings. It's a nice idea. I mean, I've even been converted to understand that solar power can mean something in, the, in our Nordic uh, climates. So, Vetland Theodor, the floor is yours. According to the International Energy Agency, the buildings and buildings construction sectors combined are responsible for almost one-third of global energy com consumption and nearly 15% of direct carbon dioxide emissions. Although most of the world is a lot more focused on climate and climate change, the energy demand from buildings still continues to rise. Now, what is something that we could do to solve this worldwide issue? 
It goes without saying that almost every building in the world uses some sort of sun shading. Now why can't window blinds also produce some of the building's electricity and help to reduce the huge energy consumption of today's buildings? This is how we came up with SolarSeek. My name is Vetle, and I'm the CFO at SolarSeek, and with me I have Theodor, our sales manager. SolarSeek will supply commercial and industrial buildings with solar cell blinds for production of green and sustainable energy. In addition to producing electricity, the blinds will also shield against solar radiation, of course. A couple of months ago, our prototype was located in a local mechanical workshop where it also was assembled. Our prototype is now mounted on a building here in Trondheim, where it currently is producing electricity, which we can measure and monitor. There is no way that we could have accomplished what we have without our essential partners. These companies have contributed with assembly, research, and much, much more. In the future, we imagine that all buildings produce enough green energy to cover its own energy consumption. For this to happen, solutions like ours are essential to utilize more of the area that can be used for production of green and sustainable energy. SolarSeek will contribute to increase the number of zero emission buildings in the world. And the green future that we all need will be one step closer. SolarSeek. A new and central energy source for the future. Thank you. Wow. Um, it struck me during this session, you know, it's really fun to see CTOs, COOs, and CFOs, which, you know, are maybe half the age of mine or something like that. That's, that's really the youngsters are going to do this. They are going to uh, power the sustainable future, that's for sure. Huh? So thank you all for your contributions, all the speakers. I hope everybody enjoyed this session. I surely did. And um, I'm uh, really happy to to say that uh, this is going to be a great conference and stay, stay on. Thank you. Thank you.